Hello, and welcome to class two of Tidy Biology. My name is Matt Hershey, and I'm glad that you're still with us. In class one, we went over the differences between R and R Studio, and we learned a little bit about the language and about how language has uh, objects and it has functions, and functions are uh, essentially operations to these objects. We also learned a little bit about the R Studio integrated developer environment and R Markdown files and how we can intersperse code and comments and notes to ourselves and, and analytical steps. So today we are going to dive into a package called Deplier. And Deplier is part of the Tidyverse, and it has a group of functions that allow us to uh, make transformations to data. This is one of the, the fundamental uh, packages that we use for data cleaning, for data analytics. And so um, today is going to um, dive deep into uh, different functions and how they uh, work within the R environment. Let's dive in. All right, welcome back. I don't think we've <laughs> lost too many students in the you know two days since the last class. So I uh, appreciate your bravery. Um, today we will have a guest lecture um, by Akshay. Um, but before we dive into that, I want to um, go over um, uh, first, ask you guys to open any question. How did the homework go? We didn't have much time to do it in class, a little bit of time. Were there any major problems? Nobody wrote anything on Slack, so I assumed that everything was perfect, beautiful, easy. Yeah? Pretty straightforward? OK. <coughs> yes, question. Um, I was just wondering if you could explain what the null command at the end of like all the lines meant. Because like, I have read the little note about it, but I just like, told Sure. So I'll show you something. Um, let's see if I can do a quick um, live demo. No idea if this is going to work. Okay. Um, let's go um, like this. Whoa. What is happening? Um, so I load a library, and then I'm going to, um, let's see, load. Um, chromosome, let's see, oh, data, chromosome. All right, so now I've got some data in there. If I go to my environment, this is here. <coughs> if I uh, uh, click on it, I can see that there's uh, um, uh, some data. So let's go to ggplot. Actually, what I'll do um, to make it a little bit uh, simpler is homework. I should have just opened the homework. OK, so um, so here, um, I also need to load tidyverse. OK, so then here, if I come down and I run this, OK, I get a plot. Now, if I didn't have null at the end and I run this, I get a plot. All right? But now, let's say I want to comment out this line. It's going to take the scale off. This is what you guys probably discovered. And I run it, and nothing happens. Okay? And the reason nothing happens is because ggplot is expecting something to come after this plus. So we'll have a ggplot lecture on Monday going into the details of it. But what ends up happening is we know about the pipe operator, which is and then. Um, ggplot, for better or worse, uses a different operator to string different commands together and they use the plus notation. So I'm going to make a plot, plus, I'm going to add a point, plus some labels, plus minimal, plus dot, dot, dot. Right? So it's, it's not expecting anything. So this um, actually is just like a little trick that you can do, because then you can comment this out, just like I did. And what happens is null is nothing, right? But it at least is a defined nothing rather than an open-ended nothing. So Sometimes I'll put this in my own code um, as I'm building it, just to make sure that I don't get these um, errors. So what ends up happening um, if you go like uh, this? Um, what ends up happening is, oh, no, let's take away null. Um, is that um, what I, you can look down here, and you can see that this is still waiting for a command. So most of the time, this command right here, this little chevron arrow, is like when you're waiting to type something in. Here, it doesn't have it because it's like the program is saying, well, I'm still waiting for something. You know, if I type in, whoa, if I come down here and I type in like null, um, then it finishes the command. It's expecting, okay, now I'm waiting for a new command. 
and then it plots it over here for you. Okay, so it's not something that you really need to know too much about. Um, I do it sometimes in my own code, um, but it's just a way for me to have you guys go through and comment without breaking it on the last line. Okay. Yes. Other questions. Um, for scale. Mm -hmm. Sure. So if we go like this and we take off, actually, we'll just run this and we'll look. So label, this labs command, this label is labeling the X and Y axis. So you can see that chromosome is here and base pairs is here. So when I get rid of this one, what happens is it will take the default labels of your column names. So this still says base pairs. It's just sort of lowercase and this is ID. And we know what ID is, but that's not that informative. So we can override the default x, y labels um, by putting them there. But there's other types of labels, including a title, subtitle, captions, and so on. OK? So we'll go like this, and we'll give it a title um, and subtitle. One more thing. So breaks, breaks is, or, or sorry, here, this um, scale y continues. This is, this is special, OK? So what this does is, it's going to then um, not talk about the label of the x or y axis. It's going to overwrite the units of the x and y axis. Okay, so this is totally accurate. It's just less intuitive. Okay, so if I change this, I also change the label to indicate that it's millions, and then it's just a little bit easier to comprehend. Okay, because I know what 50 is, and then I know what 250 is, but I don't really understand like 25 times 10 to the eighth. Okay, clear? Okay. Yeah. So I think the problem with like like if you graph different data on here, mm -hmm. different data sets have different breakpoints, mm -hmm. and so you need to like figure out what the breakpoints are in the like because I was adding continuous labels to my graph, mm -hmm. but it was saying that the, the labels weren't adding up, and I had to figure out like I just had to go in and like test each number of labels yeah. until it finally worked. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a pain, huh? I think though if you just copy paste. Whatever you have assign your whatever you assign to your labels to your breaks, mm -hmm. then you know that the labels and breaks will be equal. So as long as they have the same number, you won't have a problem. Okay. So if you just add the breaks equals and then the exactly the, the same so labels the equals. list yeah. at the end of the y continuous continuum. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Other questions. All right. One of the things that we also talked about um, yesterday was um, installing packages, OK? So we have a pop quiz, not announced. Don't worry, OK? Um, I would like you guys to install a package. And the package is called Cable Extra. You have to type it in exactly like this. This is not what you're going to type in. But I write it out for you to show you how to spell Cable Extra. So go ahead and do that in your RStudio Cloud environment. You will need that to view the help file uh, vignette that Ali wrote, that Ali made. Um, so if you remember how to install packages, install a package that is, um, has that K-A-B-L-E capital E-X-T-R-A. So go ahead and do that now. Yes? Is there any way that it can zoom? OK, let's see. You can make your font bigger. Yeah, the um, resolution is set um, here. Yeah, but I, in R, you can make your font bigger. Go to tools, options, global options. And if you go down to um, just like where you find your appearance and stuff, <coughs> yeah, one. Uh, you can change your font size. Just, uh, How's that? Better? Mm -hmm. We got more space. Yeah. Okay. You can also change your background to black, which is easier to read. <laughs> OK. So go ahead and talk to your neighbor. Ask your neighbor, did you figure it out? I figured it out. Did you figure it out? This is what I did. What did you do? Install package. Yes. What was your issue? Mm. Great. Good to know. OK. That's strange. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I use it on Chrome, too. 
Yeah. Okay. And then, so does everybody install Cable Extra? Yeah. All right. Now, one last, yes, question. Object not found. Object not found. That's because you're probably trying to install an object and not install a package. Is it in quotes? There we go. Uh, surfaces and Macs have different versions of Chrome, I believe, than base. Like. All right, now one last thing before we get into the lecture for today. So um, one of the things that I asked you to do was to go into the uh, vignette directory and knit the students.rmd for you to then generate a data frame that has, hopefully, your name, a topic, a help file topic that you will tackle, and then a function, which will be the primary function that you'll be writing about. So assuming that you did that, what I'd like you guys to do now is go to Slack. And in Slack, you have a, a channel that says vignette, help file vignette. So go into that and just say uh, like one sentence that says, my vignette will be about the topic and we'll use the function uh, the function that you have. Now, what I want you to try to do, though, and this is going to um, get a little bit um, ahead of ourselves, but I, what I want you to do is I want you to write the function in backticks like this, OK? So within Slack, go to the Slack channel. It says help file vignette. And just write a quick sentence that says, my topic is this, and my function is this. And function, I want you to put it in backticks. OK. So after you're done with that, we'll give you just another minute. And then Akshay will get going with the introduction due to Deplier, class two, all things data manipulation. <laughs> so go ahead and just take one more minute to, uh, to do that. delete, you can uh, right click and delete your message if you made a mistake. So today we'll be introducing you to the dplyr package. Um, just before we begin, uh, go into <coughs> the to underscore dplyr folder and open up the exercise RMD. Great. Um, and as I proceed to the talk, you'll be going through this um, markdown file and executing the chunks of code. So. Um, D data sets are very rarely in the exact form you need them to be in. Like maybe you need to create a new variable, or you need to reorder your rows, or maybe you want to get rid of some rows. Um, dplyr is a package that enables you to do this kind of data manipulation, which is also known as, sometimes known as, well, frequently known as data wrangling. Um, and before we, uh, for the, um, for this uh, talk, we'll be using the proteins and subcell uh, data sets within the Teddy Biology package. 
Um, so the first thing you should do is just execute the first chunk. So that's your setup to load the tidyverse package. And then go ahead and execute the next chunk, which is actually comment out the co the install. Yeah, All right. it should be on there. Great. And finally, um, for this slide, load the proteins and subcell data sets, and you should see them appear in your global environments pane. All right, um, now usually when you see a data set that you're not familiar with, you want to have a sense of the structure of the data set. So um, one useful function for allowing you to do that is the dim function, the dim stands for dimensions. Uh, and it gives you the number of dimensions of your data set. So in this case, if we want to inspect the proteins data set, we would just do dim and then put the proteins within brackets. And it gives you uh, in uh, matrix notation the number of rows is in this case 20,430, and the number of columns, eight. Um, that code executed? Cool. Um, but dim just gives you two numbers, so it's useful but limited. Um, to get uh, a deeper sense of what kind of variables your data set contains, you can use the glimpse function. And um, the syntax is the same glimpse, and then you put in your data frame within the brackets. Um, and here, it's, uh, it's a little bit more explicit. Whereas previously, you just had two numbers in your output. Now you have, it explicitly says the number of observations. So observations are always rows, and the number of variables, variables are always columns. So you, you will hear those terms used interchangeably a lot. Um, and in addition to that information, you'll also see um, it gives you some information on the various variables or columns in your data set. Um, so the first column is all the names. Um, and then within those like pointy brackets is the type of variable. So CHR is a character variable. Um, you'll see DBL double, um, which we'll talk about in the next slide. And it also gives you a, um, it shows you what some of the entries are for each column. Uh, in Matt's talk, he introduced you to the dollar uh, operator or function. And that's a base our way of extracting a variable from a data set. So it's like a handy reminder. If I just wanted to see what's in mass, I would do proteins dollar sign mass. Um, so the basic data types in R, there are six basic data types. So there's a character um, data type. So it's generally anything you see in quotes. So like A or tidyverse or my name. Um, there's numeric, which can either just be like a nice round number or uh, a number with a decimal point. And there's the integer that specifies, um, that's uh, different from a numeric um, because it's only integers, so you won't have decimals. Um, and the L in R after that number um, tells R that it's an integer. So you'll, you'll see this a lot in the, your global environment. So the L means integer. Uh, a logical is either true or false. So it can only have one of two values. Uh, and then you have complex, so if uh, the i is root minus 1 for imaginary numbers. And finally, there's a raw data type, which we won't cover, because I don't know what it is. Um, you'll also see DBL a lot, double. Uh, DBL stands for double, and it's the same as numeric. But for some arcane historic reason, there are two names in R that refer to the same thing. Um, so don't be surprised if you see DBL. It means numeric. Um, oh, and uh, factor, that's another really important thing you'll see. Uh, factor, or FCT, is uh, it's a collection of ordered character variables. So um, sometimes you'll have like a set of names where order doesn't matter. It could be John, Jacob, Ali. Or you can have a collection of um, character variables where order does matter, like the month of the year. So if you don't specify the order, for example, in R, it will think the first month is April, just because it'll do it by default alphabetically. So there you'd have to specify, no, it goes January, February, and so on. Um, right. Now, uh, to find out what type of variable uh, a specific variable is in your data set, you can um, extract it using the dollar sign, uh, so proteins dollar sign length, and you can use the class function. So in this case, 
it should be a numeric and it is a numeric. Um, oh, also just, could you just double click on the proteins uh, data set and just quickly inspect it. So you'll see it has uh, Uniprot ID, gene name, length, mass, just to get a sense of it. Um, cool. Uh, in maths, uh, Matt introduced you to the pipe operator, which is percentage sign greater than percentage sign. So um, the pipe operator is a way of chaining together um, lines of code in a way that makes it uh, both easy to understand and easy to read. Um, for example, you have this chunk here. So um, what you're doing is you're taking your protein data frame. That's always the first argument uh, that, that goes into your select function. So when you see pipe, think and then. Mm -hmm. So you take your protein data frame and then you pipe it into your select function. And what select does is it selects uh, specified variables. So in this case, you're just selecting Uniprot ID and length, and you're discarding everything else. You then just take those two variables uh, and you pipe them into the filter function. And the filter function works on rows. So the, f this, uh, the third line um, will only select rows uh, or filter rows uh, that have a protein length greater than 500 amino acids. Um, so if you execute that code chunk, you'll see underneath the code chunk um, the output. Uh, just uh, one quick thing. For the purpose of the talk, I've piped everything into a head function. What a head function does is it um, takes it an input and returns only a specified number of rows, so in this case, one. And the reason I did this is just for the sake of brevity. But you won't see a head function there. You'll see the entire output. So in my case, I have um, uh, an output that only has one row because of the head function and two columns. But you should see two columns and 20,000 rows. And the chunk that you get, actually, let me go to it. Um, so you, uh, our markdown handily, it, um, it nicely only it will show you your data 10 rows at a time. So these are the first 10 rows. And then if you wanted to see the next 10, you just you can go down here and so on. Um, oh, also just kind of a side note, you'll see this table. Table is a tidyverse, uh, it's a special kind of data frame. It's effectively equal or equivalent to a data frame. It's just that when you run, uh, if you take like your proteins and you just wanted to, ins if it were a data frame and you inspected it in your console, uh, it would, R would just output 20,000 rows, which isn't useful. Uh, but if you converted it to a tibble, it would only show you the number of rows that fits in your console. So it's like it's made to fit in your console. So it's just a, an aesthetic difference. Um, so yeah, so just to reiterate, this code chunk takes proteins, pipes it into select, select chooses the specified columns, uh, and then um, pipes that into the filter command, which then filters rows um, that correspond to proteins that have a length of uh, greater than 500 amino acids. So yeah, when you see that pipe operator, always think and then. Also, it's kind of uh, annoying to have to go uh, percentage sign greater than percentage sign, but if you go in um, uh, on a MacBook, if you go Command Shift M, and in a win on a Windows machine, if you go Control Shift M, you that's a shortcut to getting a pipe. Um, the alternative to using a pipe operator is to just have one long line, um, which I suppose you could argue is more efficient because it's one line as opposed to three. Uh, and if you execute that chunk, you'll see that you get the same output, but this is a lot more um, error prone because it's super easy to miss commas and brackets. As a heads up on a Windows machine, if you uh, control shift N, you'll just get a new document. <laughs> so. I do that all the time. <laughs> all right, so, um, so d the dpi package consists of um, various functions or verbs, and we've already been introduced to two of them. Uh, well, more than two, a few of them. Uh, so some of the things you can do, uh, 
in the dplyr packages as i mentioned you can select rows and columns based on uh, certain conditions you can create new columns or new variables um, and you can also obtain summary statistics like mean or median of uh, numeric variables um, and so these are the functions we'll be covering today uh, select filter arrange mutate and summarize and finally there's a group by function that works uh, with these functions so the first function is select so select uh, only applies to columns or variables um, so the most basic select um, uh, function is where you take uh, a list of column names that are comma separated um, as input so for example from the protein data frame if you just wanted as previously if you just wanted the uniprot ID and length columns you would do this and if you run that chunk you'll get something similar to mine except again in my case I only have the first row you'll have 20,000 rows Cool. Um, if you wanted to select everything except uniprot ID because you want interest in that for whatever reason uh, you can um, you can run this where you do minus whatever your variable name is and it'll exclude that and only output and output everything else I should say uh, when you run um, code chunks like this the output you get is temporary it's not saved so uh, to save an output in R you always have to assign it to an object which we'll do later on um, and this is fine for now but presumably when you're doing your own analysis you want to save um, some output. So this is what it looks like. Um, right. Um, let's say you, in this case, I think there are only eight variables. Let's say you had 800 and you wanted to select 300 variables. Now you could type them out manually, which is inefficient. Or if they, they're all in a row, um, what you can do is you can use colon. And what that does is it takes um, the the variable on the left uh, hand side of the colon and the variable on the right hand side selects those two and everything in between. So if you run that code chunk, you'll see that this produces, this selects four columns, the uniprot ID and protein name, and the two that are in between, gene name and gene name alternative. Cool. Um, right, so that is select. And if you could do a quick exercise, uh, so that code chunk will be empty um, and if you select the following columns from the proteins uh, data frame uniprot ID sequence length and mass give you like a couple of minutes you know, really complicated there's two different ways to do this you can select your data frame and then I'm sorry so you, you select or start with your data frame and then select the things that you want from it the other is if you go to um, the help tab or you go to um, the select uh, uh, help from your console, you'll see that um, select can run by itself. You can start with the, um, the, the object that you want to select. You don't need to pipe anything to it. So uh, when you see something like this, you say select the first argument is your data, in this case a data frame. And then um, uh, from here, the other arguments are the, the expressions of the things that you want to select. So um, if I were doing one uh, uh, one line of, of code only, I would maybe write something like this. Select my data frame as proteins. So hit enter a bunch of times to make it, uh, no, scroll just a little bit so we can see it. Oh, um, scroll so, so like this. Okay, so there's two fingers to scroll. So you can see select that's the object I'm selecting from, and then my arguments are the things I want to select. But if I was more likely, um, I would put this into a pipe and chain these together, where it's proteins and then select. And you don't need to write proteins again, because it already knows. It's receiving the information of proteins from the pipe, from the previous one. So in this, in this example, you could say, all right, this is actually easier to do than a pipe, and you'd be right. Um, but it's good to get into the habit of writing pipes or using pipes all right so um, so this is a solution uh, you could just like type them all out or you 
you see, you'll see that um, sequence, length, and mass are all in a row. So you can just do comma, sequence, colon, mass. Um, that's a solution. So the filter verb, moving on to the filter verb, uh, this function uh, allows you to select rows um, based on a certain condition or conditions, and it discards everything else. Um, so all filters are performed on some kind of logical statement. So any kind of statement that produces uh, a true-false um, output. Uh, so if uh, a row, a specific row meets the condition you set, or i.e. is true, it gets selected. If not, it gets discarded. Um, so you can perform a filtering operation on categorical data. So in this case, it's like groups. Um, so for example, so um, this is using the subcell data frame, which uh, has information on subcellular location of proteins. So let's say I was only interested in proteins that are associated with the ribosome. So again, you take subcell and then you pipe that data frame into the filter um, function. And location is the name of a uh, variable. And you do the equality operator, so equal, equal. Um, and then I only want ribosomes. So I do ribosome. And you make sure that you put it in uh, quotes. Um, a common mistake here is to go location equals ribosome. If you do that, you're trying to assign ribosome to location, which is, you don't want to do that. It'll be, you will get an error. So if you're doing some kind of like uh, logical operation, so in this case, equal to, you have to do equal, equal. Um, and again, I've typed that into head, so you'll only see the, I will only see the front row, uh, the first row, you will see everything. Um, so if you inspect the, um, the output, if you look at the location column and you scroll down through it, uh, you'll only see ribosome. So it confirms that you've only selected rows uh, that have ribosome in the location column. Great. Does location just like a general word? Uh, so location uh, in this specific data frame refers to um, uh, cell uh, locations within the cell. Okay. How is that defined? Um, for this data frame, it's um, like uh, like ribosome, mitochondria, and cytosol. Okay. Right. Uh, but it's specific to the. Uh, that's a good point. This is only specific to this data frame. Like if you uh, if you piped in proteins into this code, you'd get an error because there's no location variable in proteins. Um, right, and you can also uh, use fil uh, use numerical data um, for a filtering operation. So, for example, let's say I wanted to select proteins. So this score is a, um, I guess it's like a confidence score. Like how confident are you that a certain proteins associated with a certain location, with five being very confident. So let's say you're, I'm only interested in uh, location scores greater than four. So I only want like high confidence scores. Uh, I would run the following code. So again, this is identical to the previous line, except the um, what goes into the filter brackets. So in this case, it's your score greater than 4. And if you run that code chunk and inspect the score column, you'll only see numbers that are greater than 4. Um, and also, this data frame, this output has fewer rows because you're filtering out stuff that's less than or equal to four. Um, oftentimes, you'll want to filter on multiple conditions. So one way to do that is to just string together multiple um, filter commands separated by the pipe operator. So let's say I wanted to select proteins that are associated with the ribosome and have a location score greater than four. So doing the previous two things together. You could do it like this. You pipe in your subcell into the first filter command that only selects rows, only selects proteins associated with the ribosome. You take that output and you filter that into the second filter command, which only selects proteins with a location score greater than four. Um, and this is the output. Uh, a more efficient way of doing the previous thing is um, because, for example, these were only two conditions, so it's 
it's fine to do two filters, but let's say you had 50 conditions. And so you have like, instead of having 50 rows of filter, 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 you can just have one filter command and put in all your conditions within that filter and separated by commas. So this code chunk does the same thing as the previous one, except you just have one filter command. And you have two conditions, and they're separated by a comma. Um, the comma, you can read that as and. So you want proteins that are ribosome located and have a location score greater than four. And if you run that code chunk and you compare it to the output of the previous code chunk, you'll see it's the same. Um, I think that's it for filter. So again, quick exercise um, using the filter command. So I should have specified. So you would, in this case, use, again, the subcell um, data set, not the proteins. So using the subcell um, data frame, uh, filter all proteins not associated with the ribosome and with a score um, less than or equal to four. So just as a hint, um, just as equal equal was equal to, um, exclamation mark equal or bang equal means not equal to, and uh, less than or equal to operators less than or equal to. It will feel awkward at first, but get used to the uh, the keyboard shortcuts for the pipe operator. Definitely. It's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you what it is, but I can I can do it myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. I can verbally tell you what it is. I drew mine myself So also as a hint, if you just copy paste the previous code chunk and just change a couple of things, you'll get the right answer. So a couple of things just to remember. There's, um, there's something that's called a style guide, which is sort of the, the style of how you write your code. Now those will become a sort of intensely personal um, a, a thing. Um, but there's a couple of conventions that will be important here. So when you say filter, you put the parentheses right after filter because if you don't, filter looks like an object, right? It's a non-quoted word. But if you put a parentheses after it, it knows that this is now a function. And then it does everything within the function until it sees the back end of that parentheses. So that's important. When you see the um, uh, spaces around the pipe operator, you can have space or you don't. I like to put space. Ali doesn't. I like to let my code breathe. <laughs> uh, I like to uh, let my code breathe a little bit. I corrected a bunch of alleys the other day, um, you know, preparing for the lectures. <laughs> so, um, so there are some things that matter. There's some things that don't matter. Um, like here, again, head, that's a function, right? So head needs to come right after uh, the parentheses. So just, again, there's going to be some things that are style, and there will be some things that are absolutely crucial. Otherwise, um, R will get confused. Again, this is like the language to learn how to speak the language. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I put it before pipes, okay. before buses. <laughs> Let your code breathe a little bit. Also, these like little um, spaces before filter are automatically does that to you, but it doesn't strictly have to be there. Everything can hug the left margin, but it's nice. I don't know. I've gotten used to seeing it like this, and other people's code also looks like this, so it's just nicer to see. But it won't break. Actually, you could put this all on one row if you wanted to, but then it would go beyond the right-hand margin, so that would be maybe problematic. Um, should I go ahead and... Anybody have any problems with that exercise? We're not having it done yet? Cool. <laughs> so, uh, your should look something like this. I'll show it again. Uh, okay, a range. Um, so a range is a, is a 
pretty simple function. It allows you to rearrange your rows, um, well, arrange your rows. Um, so if you do it, if you arrange based on a numeric um, variable, it'll by default arrange from the smallest to the largest or the shortest to the longest. So for example, if you wanted to know, if you wanted to go from your um, shortest to your longest protein using the protein's um, data frame, you would run this code. So you take your protein's data frame, you pipe it into the arrange uh, verb, and um, since you want to go from shortest to longest, you would use your length variable. Um, if you execute that, you'll see you go from something that's two amino acids long to something that's much longer. Um, and in this case, I put a head three just so that you could see the top three, um, but you don't see the length variable here, so it's not very useful. But in yours, you'll see it'll be in ascending length. Now, let's say you wanted to go the other way around from longest to shortest. Um, it's almost the same, except you would put a descend, a DESC, a descend function within your range. Um, so again, this looks almost identical to the previous one, except you put descend within a range, and the, the argument that goes into descend is, again, length. And it looks like this. And Titan's the longest one. Um, yeah. All right, so that's basically kind of all you can do with a range. So the quick exercise with a range is what happens when you apply a range to a categorical variable? So choose either data, data frame, proteins, or subcell and pick whatever non-numeric categorical variable you like. Um, apply the arrange function to that and look at your output. Like, wh what is R decided to do with a categorical variable? <coughs> so what I did was, uh, as a solution to this exercise, is I took the proteins data set and uh, data frame and I picked the gene name alt character variable uh, categorical, vari categorical variable, and uh, when you run that, so this is maybe not the best example because um, within this character variable there are numbers also, and numbers aren't letters, but in R it goes the order 0, 1, 2, 3 to 9, and then A, B, C, D, E. So categorical variable will arrange it in alphabetical order. All right, so um, all the functions introduced so far, um, they don't... Um, create new variables. So mutate is the first uh, function that generates a whole new, uh, one or more new variables. Um, so if you run the mutate chunk, this what this does is, um, again, you take your proteins data set and you pipe it into the mutate function. Uh, it takes the length variable from the proteins data set and applies a square root function. That's what the SQRT is. And it takes the output of all those 20,000 something square roots and assigns those values to a new column called square root underscore length. So if you look at your output, um, you'll see that instead of eight columns, there's now nine. And by default, whenever you create a new variable using mutate, the new variable or variables will appear at the end. So your last variable here is called square root length and it's the square root, contains the square roots of the lengths of all the proteins. Um, so in the previous example, you, we just used one variable, length, to create a new variable, square root length. You can combine different variables within your data set to create a new one. So for example, if you wanted to normalize protein length to protein mass, you could run this. So in, in this case, again, you are taking your proteins data set, piping it into the mutate function. You take your length and mass variables, divide one by the other, and you assign the output of that to a new variable called protein length, underscore length, underscore mass. And again, if you look at your output, that's the last uh, column. Right. Question. This doesn't update the protein data. Good point. It doesn't, so y the output you get is temporary. Your original proteins data set is, um, is as is unchanged, and actually that's a good convention. You might be tempted. I'm free. I frequently do this, which is not good practice. Is to overwrite your original data set. You could assign this output to proteins, and it will overwrite the previous one. 
But if you wanted to make a new data frame, it's best to create a new object called proteins new, something like that. And so it generates a new data frame. But yeah, the original proteins stays remains unchanged. Uh, I went through that kind of quickly. That? I mean, that's actually that's really important. So I'll just pause and interrupt. Did, did you guys understand that that point? Yes, no, clear. Um, like for the sake of this example, like I could run the arrange thing. Oops. Right, and it looks like this. But this output isn't saved anywhere. Um, if I did the assign operator, which I'll maybe I should have introduced this before, but I'll introduce this in a couple of slides, and call this proteins new. And I run this. If you look at your uh, global environments, now there's a new data frame. It's called proteins new. And if I <laughs> click that, there's a new one. And it's kind of hard to tell here because I've just applied a range, so I haven't created any new, I haven't filtered anything out or changed the columns. But here it'll be a range. The, uh, the order of the rows will be different. Yeah, you can see row one is typed. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. Um, but and I don't want to do it here because I'll be using pro. I'll continue to use proteins. If I did this, the original protein data frame would be overwritten. Uh, right. Yes. Question. For the sake of this class, is it being overwritten to tidy biology? No. Mm. Okay. No. Any changes that you make, it's just in your environment. So that's why like, you guys all made a save a copy, and that's why we're using the RStudio Cloud. So that's yours to break. Um, but if you needed to, um, uh, let's say you overwrote something that you didn't need to, what you would do is you would just close that R markdown or something, and you can open up. You can actually load. You wouldn't even need to um, close it. You could reload the original. Um, uh, a data that's in the tidy biology package. So you're not actually overwriting anything in the package. So like the package is, has data in it, and that first command that says data um, uh, proteins, that's then essentially extracting data from the package and putting it in your environment for you to do something with. So if you did make a mistake or you needed to start fresh, you would just say, you would overwrite the uh, proteins data frame in your environment by just running data proteins and that then overwrites it. Just like if you assign an operator, um, um, or you, you assign you know, anything to proteins, it would also overwrite it. That's a good question. Um, what time does the class end? 11.40. Oh, yeah. weird. Oh, oh, right, I should say something. Um, so the mutate exercise, so for this exercise, if you could use the proteins data set, to make a new variable, call it whatever you like, um, that contains the values of the protein lengths divided by 100. And just to remind you, this is the syntax of the mutate function. Mutate new variable equals existing variable, and you've done something to it. So this is one solution. Um, so this 
called takes your protein state to set, pipes into the mu mutate function, you take your length variable, divided by 100, assign it to, I called it protein underscore length underscore 100, and you get a new column. All right. Um, the summarize um, verb is, it does what it says. It takes, um, it takes uh, one or more variables and it um, gives you a summary statistic of those one or more variables. Um, so for example, if you wanted to calculate the um, mean of the length and mass columns of the protein status set, you would run this code. So you take protein status set, you pipe it into the summarize function, and then you do mean uh, length variable, comma, mean mass variable. And the output of this, unlike all the previous outputs, is a very small one. It just has one row, uh, and that's the mean length and mean mass. So this is a really intuitive, simple um, function within the dplyr package. Now, um, let's say you wanted, so in this previous example, um, R just calls the new columns mean, length, mean, mass. Let's say you wanted to give your own names to it. Um, you would run this chunk of code, which is very similar to the previous one, except you take your mean length and you assign it to a new variable you give it a name, and you take your mean mass and you do the same. You assign it to a new variable. So the only difference between this output and the previous one is this has nicer names. But this is a really minor thing. You could just do summarize mean your variable, and you'd get the same output. Oops, yeah. Um, so that's really all you can do with summarize. Um, so for the summarize exercise, uh, you make a new table where you calculate the, or you report the mean, median, and standard deviations of protein lengths. Again, using the proteins data set. Um, so the, to get the mean, you would use the mean function. To get the median, you would use the median function, which is just median, open close brackets. And for standard deviation, the function is SD, open close brackets. And again, I'll go back just to, this is what your syntax should look like. Z, just in case. <laughs> oh yeah, a tidy bus is <laughs> tolerant of different alternative spellings. <laughs> so like it accepts, so in ggplot you'll see like for the color, uh, argument, you can either go C-O-L-O-R or C-O-L-O-U-R, and it still works. All right, um, so this is one solution. Um, so this way you get like pretty names. You get, you assign names, but you can do it just as well without these protein underscore mean equal. You can just do mean length, median length, SD length. Uh, and your output, again, should be just this. You get three columns, one row. Um, the final function we'll be introducing today is the group by function. And group by works nicely with the other um, functions introduced. So in this um, talk, we'll just discuss how group by and summarize work together. So previously you saw like summarize mean length of all the proteins. But let's say you're interested in um, if we had a subcellular lo location for in the proteins data set, you were only interested in, you were interested in mean lengths per region, you would use group by. So you basically do the same thing, you do the summary, the summarize, but by different groups. This should hopefully make it clearer. Um, so for example, if you wanted to know the mean location score of proteins in each location, uh, you would use group by. Because if you just did subcell, pipe that into summarize, 
um, location, you'd get one number. That's just the overall location score, uh, overall mean. But if you did subcell, execute this code, you group by location, and then do summarize mean score, this is the output you get. So the 15 rows correspond to 15 different locations in this data set, so ribosome, mitochondria, and so on. Um, and then you get two columns, one for the location, and one that has a mean score within that location. If you um, didn't do this group by, your output would just be one row, and that would be the mean location score for all the proteins. Um, right, so there's no exercise for that, that's just group by. So let's say you wanted to, so, so far, everything we've done, we've just made a temporary output but you want to create new data frames based on the analysis you've done or the wrangling you've done. Uh, for that, you have to assign your code chunk to a, um, a new object. Um, and you can either do the left-hand operator or the right-hand, um, and it, it works the same. But for the sake of um, like, uh, doing the, the if you were following the style guide, you would do the left-hand operator, although I constantly use the right-hand one. So for example, the previous code chunk, if you wanted to save that, you could do something like this. You Again, you have your code as is, and then you use the left-hand operator to assign it to a new var uh, object, in the, which in this case I've called subcell underscore new. So if you execute that chunk, and you look at your global environments, you'll see that there's a new um, data set called subcell underscore new. You double click on that, you you can then see the output or what it contains. Uh, if you wanted to save that, um, so this is right This is right now a data frame within R, but it's not saved on your computer. Uh, if you wanted to save it as, for example, a CSV file, um, you could use this handy write underscore CSV function, which is within um, the tidyverse. And this takes in just two inputs. It takes your new data frame, so you have to assign, you have to create a new data frame. And that's the first argument, comma, and then the name of your CSV file. So your name could be whatever you want, dot CSV. So if you execute that chunk, and you look um, in your files, you'll see a new file has been created, and it'll be called subcell underscore new. And so you have a CSV file now. Um, Now, if you want to know more about the dplyr package, um, all the packages within the tidyverse, uh, and kind of packages in general, come with vignettes, which are really handy guides for using that package. So dplyr has a set of vignettes. And to access those vignettes, you can run this function, browse vignettes with a capital V, um, and dplyr in quotes. If you run that, you might get a pop-up blocker. Um, but if you... Uh, ignore that, you will get a new, it'll take you to a, a website, um, and it'll have a list of all the vignettes that are within, within this package as an HTML and also in just R code, um, which these are all really useful, these vignettes. So another way to get to it, I'll do that again slowly. So um, come to your help pane, which is over here. And just type in deplyr, D P L Y R. And what you'll get is the info page about the package deplyr description, details, and so on. Maintainer, authors, contributors. If you go down here and click on index all the way at the bottom, you'll get all of the help pages and documentation for the entire package. You can see it's quite rich. The second one here is going to be user guides, package vignettes, and other documentation. If you click on that, it will lead you to the same sort of page, same options as typing it in. And then what you can do is click on any of these uh, vignettes. You can click back. And it will give you the information for the deplier vignette, the introduction vignette. Cool. Thanks, Matt. And this would be another useful opportunity to then highlight 
one of the two sort of final projects will be your creating a vignette. So rather than creating just like a help page, what we want to do is have you with your fresh eyes on a problem. How do you solve a problem? Well, we gave you the function that will likely be the most useful to solve that problem. But so you can spend some time with the vignettes and essentially what we hope for you to be able to do is to, over the next uh, two weeks, is to be able to, um, to create a vignette about solving a problem using a single function. All right, so Ali and Akshay have provided some examples. That's in the uh, help file vignette uh, directory within the RStudio cloud. So you can spend some time with vignettes, but really think of them as, as um, rather than the, the help file, which is a function-centric uh, documentation, then vignette is a problem-centric documentation that helps you solve a problem. In some cases, you can even have a vignette that's an introduction to an entire package. Uh, but most vignettes you will see solve a problem, and then they will walk you through that problem with a combination of plain text and code. Um, cool. And that's, that's it for the talk. Um, in preparation for this, um, I watched a talk by Hadley Wickham. So he's the guy who uh, has led the development of the Taibas. Um, and he and he introduced this talk by saying, with these functions, you should be able to do like 90% of all the things you need to do. So these are there's just a few functions, and compared compared to Besa, which has like thousands of functions that can do these things, um, this is yeah, it's a much shorter list of functions. And you have things called helper functions that you can put within your filter and select things like ends with. So you just filter things that end with RNA things like that and gets it can get more and more elaborate um, but just with this you can do you can do so much um, and as an exercise uh, if you would like uh, you just double uh, click on the homework RMD and this essentially goes through the same things we went through in the talk but using the chromosome data set uh, and there are some questions I've put in that should help reinforce these concepts if there's uh, any issues just um, posted on Slack. So you have a little time now. So yeah. you can go ahead and start on this now if you'd like. Or if you're hungry for lunch, you can <laughs> run the nosh or something. So um, we'll hang out. We'll spend a little time now. I'll help you guys uh, through some of these problems. Um, and then just one last thing to uh, mention to you. So part of the reason that we have these uh, both exercises and homework files is to give you guys the code, right? Because I said to you that we are envisioning the, the impossible for you, is to go from nearly no knowledge of R in five classes to doing an entire analysis de novo of a data set or data sets that you really know little about to extract some interesting biological insight. That's a tall order, right? I have faith in you guys, don't worry. Um, but one of the things that we want to do to help is to provide you with examples that you can then use, both the code, but also the, the ideas that you can then use for your own project, right? Because the main sort of summary and the main wrap up for this entire course will be your short presentation of what you did, how you did it, what you found, and what you would do to test it. So if you go through these examples, what you should be able to do is then begin to learn about these uh, data sets and be able to, uh, to use some of the code then to apply it to your final project. Okay. Thank you, Akshay. Thank you, Pat. So it's, uh, again, 11.35, so you've got a little bit of time. Um, we will have class three on Monday. This is going to be a dive into visualization. So Ali will be giving a lecture on ggplot which is a package that is um, all things data visualization. So as uh, Akshay said, if you have questions over the weekend as things come up, then um, reach out on Slack. We're here to help. All right, that wraps up Tidy Biology for today. Thank you for watching. And if you have any comments, go ahead, put them below. If you like us, give us a thumbs up. If you wanna see more of this, go ahead, hit the subscribe and you'll see all of the videos that we post about tidy biology. Thanks, see you again.